And turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to read together verses 14 through 16. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 14 and reading through verse 16. And if you're able and willing to stand, would you please stand in honor of the public reading of God's Word. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. And this is what the Word of the Lord says. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Father, for all of us today, we need grace and mercy. Some of us need it more than others today. Some of us need grace and mercy to come to Jesus in faith today. Some of us need grace and mercy to trust Jesus in faith today. Some of us need grace and mercy to get through the difficult moments of our lives right now. But all of us stand in need of the mercy and grace that is available to us because Jesus, the Son of God, has come into your presence. And so, Lord, my prayer is that you would convict us today that it is one thing to say we trust in you and a whole other thing to actually trust you by turning to you in our need. May we this day trust Jesus by turning to him for grace and mercy in our time of need. We pray it in his name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. A lot of times as a pastor I stand around with my congregation and you all like to tell me what's going on in the news and clearly you have one perspective over another. Everybody has a perspective and you sometimes look to me for affirmation. I try not to give affirmation very often because I don't want people to walk around saying the pastor said he agreed with me. You'd be surprised how often that happens. It comes back to me that I said I believe such and such or so and so, and I think, when did I ever say that? So I don't like to smile and nod in agreement very often. And that's usually because not only do I know what you think, uh, do not know what you think about any given issue, but sometimes I don't even know what you're talking about. I really try to stay out of the news as much as possible. It just makes my life a lot better that way. But this week I happened across a little story in the current climate that we're in, lots of changes are being made, and a lot of those changes rightfully so, and the state of Mississippi making a change to its state flag, and one of the proposals that comes with the changing of the state flag in the state of Mississippi is the inclusion of four words, and those four words have caused quite a bit of controversy this week. You know them, they're on our currency, it's our motto as a nation, in God we trust. I bet my response was probably not the same response a lot of you had when you saw that news. My response was, what is the big deal? And the reason that I thought, what is the big deal, is because for the vast majority of people in these United States, and probably in the state of Mississippi, those are nothing but four words. They don't actually mean anything. They don't actually convey the message that they purport to convey. There are a lot of people who would rally around the motto, who would say we should be able to say that this is our creed as a people, as Americans, when in all actuality they don't trust in God or maybe don't even know who he is. And then, of course, I had to think about my life and ask the question that every one of us has to ask today. Do I trust in God? Not do I believe in Him. Not as an academic idea. Not as 
a mere matter of fact, not as a statement of principle. Oh, I understand. We all, at least in this place, if you've been here before, should know the very tenets of the gospel. We believe that Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, came into the world. He lived a perfect life. He died a substitute death. He was laid in a borrowed tomb. He was raised on the third day. He appeared to more than 500 of his disciples. He ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he is coming back one day in glory to condemn the wicked and to vindicate the righteous. And there are many of us who on the face of that would say, I trust that, I believe in that, that's good. But when the time comes that we face difficult moments in our lives, when we come to a hardship or to a stormy season, I wonder, do we actually trust in God? The writer to the Hebrews wondered that as well. His congregation was experiencing difficulty. They were thinking about walking away from Jesus. They were looking back to Moses, to the law, to the prophets, to the fast and the feast, to all of the, the outer signs of Judaism, thinking it would be better if we went back to that faith rather than stayed with Jesus because at least we didn't have to face the hardships that we do now when we were Jews. And the writer to the Hebrews, he's their pastor, he's a preacher, and this is a sermon as much as it is a letter. He's writing to them to say, listen, you don't understand what's at stake. You don't understand the significance of what you're considering. You, you don't understand that the law and the prophets won't get you anywhere. You, you don't understand that Moses really isn't as great as you think he is. You, you don't understand. Let me tell you, Jesus is, he's a greater messenger, greater than all of the the angels. Jesus is a greater missionary, greater than Moses who fulfilled the mission that God gave him. Jesus is superior to all the things the world can offer and because he has passed into the heavens, into the presence of the Father and has gripped the rock of ages, there is no one else you ought to trust in your life. And because he's there at the right hand of the Father, he's worth trusting He's worth holding fast to. He's worth clinging on to even when it costs you something. See, the writer has given several strong instructions throughout this letter. In chapter 2 and verse 1, he told his congregation, he said, pay much closer attention to what you've heard. In chapter 3 and verse 1, he said, Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. In chapter 3 and verse 12, he said, Take care lest there be in you an evil, unbelieving heart. In chapter 4 and verse 1, he said, Fear, fear, lest you should have failed to reach the promised rest. In chapter 4 and verse 11, he said, Strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall. And now the writer comes to this place, taking all of his words of warning and all of his words of witness, and he brings them to a head. And he offers here two instructions for the people of God. He says in verse 14, let us hold fast our confession. And then he says in verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. And it occurs to me that there are many of us trying to hold fast to our confession without drawing near to the throne of grace. What I want you to understand today, my dear friend, is that the endurance of your confession of faith is entirely linked to the exercising of your faith in Christ. Whether or not you persevere to the end, whether or not you come into the kingdom of God, whether or not it is proved that your faith was real from the beginning is tied up in the reality that through your life you demonstrate trust in Jesus Christ. 
And it is one thing to say, I trust in Him, and it is a whole other thing to actually trust. So the writer gives two commands. Let us hold fast our confession of faith. Let us draw near to the throne of grace where we may find grace and mercy to help in a time of need. Two commands that can't be separated. The writer begins by talking about the identity of Jesus. You see, our response to Him, our demonstration of trust in Him, our walk of faith in Him, it all hinges on who Jesus is. And so the writer begins by identifying our high priest. And in this, these three verses, he says four things about our high priest. The first thing that he says is that our high priest has passed through the heavens. Look at verse 14. He says, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. The writer wants us to understand that Jesus, as the Son of God, as the one sent from the Father, fulfills a unique role. He is an apostle, that is, he is one who was sent to his people, and he is a high priest. He told us as much in chapter 2 and verses 17 through 19. The writer here is coming back to that understanding of Jesus as our high priest, and he says he has passed into the heavens. Now, what's the writer talking about there? Well, if you remember your Old Testament history, you know that, that the way that the system worked is that the tabernacle, or later the temple, was set up through a series of passages or a series of courts or rooms. Uh, on the outskirts of the temple were where the Gentiles could be. If you were not a part of the covenant people of God, you stayed furthest out from the place where God dwelled with men. And then there was a court of women, a court where Jewish women could go, and, and they were a little bit closer to God than the Gentiles. And, and then there was the court of Israel, where all of the Jewish men were allowed to go, but, but they weren't as close to God as others. And then there was the court of the priests, where the priests did their work, where they functioned, where they went through their rituals, where they performed the works of the law. And at the center of it all, was the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the Holy of Holies on the seat of the Ark of the Covenant was where the mercy seat was. And that is where God dwelt with men. And one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, having gone through his rites of purification, could go and offer a work of atonement on behalf of the people of God in the presence of God, in the Holy of Holies. One day a year. When the writer talks about the fact that our high priest has passed into the heavens, it is symbolic of, it's a way of describing the access that has been granted to the presence of the Father by Christ the Son. The writer is saying that just as the high priest passed into the Holy of Holies one day of a year and brought a work of atonement and intercession on behalf of the people of God, so Jesus, the Son of God, has permanently passed into the presence of the Father and He is ever there working on our behalf, making intercession for us. Access has been opened up. Who is our high priest? Well, he's the one who has passed into the heavens. And then we ask, well, who is our high priest? He is Jesus, the Son of God. Verse 14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. The writer makes clear, in case we were wondering who this high priest is who intercedes for the people of God, who is this high priest who has passed eternally into the presence of the Father. Well, it is not a mere mortal. It is the God-man, Jesus Christ. The writer says he is Jesus, the Son of God. And right there in that terminology, we have pictured for us the full humanity and full divinity of of the God-man Jesus Christ. He isn't partially God and partially man. 
He is fully God who became fully man. And at the right hand of the Father, He still exists in bodily form. He was bodily raised from the dead. He bodily ascended to the right hand of the Father. He bodily intercedes for us. He is ever the God-man who makes intercession for us. He is Jesus, the Son of God. The writer wants you to understand from the outset that this high priest who intercedes for you, this high priest whom you can trust, this high priest who is able to offer mercy and grace in your time of need is one who fully understands your reality because he became your reality. It revolutionized my life the first time that I considered the fact that at the right hand of the Father is the bodied Christ. When I realized, I, I, I should have known that, but, but it just never set into my heart that the same Jesus who was bodily raised from the dead, who bodily ascended to the right hand of God, is there in His glorified bodily state interceding on my behalf that revolutionized my prayer life. Because all of a sudden I recognized that it's a real person who gets me, who understands my struggles, who knows what it's like to deal with my temptations, who went through everything I've been through, yet, we'll see, is without sin. Who is this high priest? Well, he's the one who passed into the heavens. And he's Jesus, the Son of God. And then we see the writer saying that this high priest is the one who is not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He says in verse 16, or verse 15, excuse me, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. The writer wants us to understand that the high priest who intercedes for us, the high priest who calls us into the presence of the Father, the high priest who offers grace and mercy to us, is one who gets us. He's one who understands us. And so the way that he says that is that he is not one who cannot sympathize, which means he is one who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Do you notice that he says, with our weaknesses? He doesn't say with our strengths. The writer isn't saying that Jesus simply became the better part of humanity, that He only dealt with the strong issues of humanity, that He only went through the, the, the easy parts of life. No, no, no. The writer says that this high priest who intercedes for you, this high priest who is in the presence of the Father for you, this high priest who offers grace and mercy to you, is one who has dealt with all of the weaknesses of humanity. He gets it. He knows what it's like to experience the struggles and the hardships and the frailty of human existence. Surely that's never more true than on the day of His passion when they took His body and pushed it to its extremities when they beat him beyond recognition, when they scourged him and left the skin hanging from his back in shreds, when he was bloodied and bruised and climbed the weight of a cross up a hill, and when they left him hanging to die. He is not one, dear friend, who cannot sympathize with your weaknesses. Whether that's the weakness that you experience through temptation to sin, he understands that because Matthew chapter 4 says that he experienced temptation in the wilderness, that Satan offered him bread, he offered him control, he wanted to give him all authority if he'd only bow down, and yet he resisted. Or whether that's the frailty of the body, the weakness of the body, 
that as you age and experience the difficulties of a body that is broken and marred by sin, that increasingly doesn't work like it used to, he gets that as well. Who is this high priest? He is the one who has passed into the heavens. He is Jesus, the Son of God. He is, one who, he is not one who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. And then the writer says, perhaps most significant of all, he is the high priest who was tempted, yet is without sin. Verse 15 says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Every church in its history has a pastor it loved. Every church has pastors it didn't love, but every church has a pastor it loved. In recent memory, I, I'm not even going to ask. I know who it is. Y'all love John Faulkner better than life itself, didn't you? He's a good man. He's worthy of the honor that you gave to him and you continue to give to him. If we went back 100 years in the life of Friendship Baptist Church, it was another John that Friendship loved. His name was John Robinson. John Robinson served as the pastor of Friendship Baptist Church for 47 years. Bet y'all didn't know that, did you? John Robinson served as pastor of Friendship Baptist Church for 47 years in a time when he was elected by annual call. That means he didn't come on one call and they liked him and he got to stay 47 years. They re-elected him as pastor every year. That means they liked him, y'all. Of course, he only preached once a month, so I don't know. Maybe it evens out over time. <laughs> Can you imagine how long the sermon was? <laughs> but here's what I know. Whether it's John Robinson or John Faulkner or some other pastor who's meant a whole lot to you, every pastor you've ever had who was worth his salt was still a sinner in the eyes of a holy God. And every high priest who ever served to go into the presence of the Father in the Holy of Holies was a sinner in the eyes of a holy God. The only high priest who has ever been sinless, who has ever withstood the weaknesses of the world, who has ever been able to conquer every temptation that came his way, is Jesus, the Son of God, who has passed eternally into the heavens and who is not incapable of dealing with the weaknesses that you and I deal with. Brothers and sisters, the identity of this high priest matters because he he is the one we trust. He is the one we turn to. He is the one we tell all our problems to. He is the one our lives are dependent upon. So from the outset, the writer wants us to understand who this high priest is. He is the one who passed into the heavens. He is Jesus the Son of God. He is the one who is not incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses. And He is the one who was tested and tempted, yet is without sin. And then the writer would ask us to consider what that means for us. He identifies the priesthood of Jesus and then he gives the implications of that priesthood. And there are two of them. First, the writer says in verse 14 that because of Jesus' priestly ministry, because he has passed into the heavens, because he has dealt with the weaknesses of humanity, because he is without sin, because of who Jesus is, we should hold fast our confession of faith. He says in verse 14, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold our confession fast. If we stopped there, we really wouldn't have much more than what the writer has already told us. 
All throughout this letter, as we said earlier, the writer has been giving instructions, admonitions, directives to the people of God. Consider Jesus. Fear God. Hold fast to your confession. Be careful lest there be in you an unbelieving heart. To all of those instructions that the writer has given so far, we would add this instruction, because of who Jesus is as our high priest, we should hold fast our confession. And yet, we would still be left without the practical nature by which we are able to hold fast. Okay, I understand, preacher. That's what we ought to do. That's what we're aiming for. We don't want to give up. We don't want to drift away. We don't want to lose heart. We don't want to turn our back on Jesus. You want us to hold fast our confession that we've had from the beginning. But my soul, how do we do it? You ever been there? You walk away from a sermon. The preacher got all hot and bothered and shared the gospel and preached up a storm and implored you to stay fast and hold fast to your faith and cling to Jesus and you wondering how in the world am I going to do that when life gets tough on Monday morning well here the preacher gives you the how because he goes on and says that the second implication of Jesus' priesthood is not just that we should hold fast our confession of faith, but then he says in verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The writer says that the way that you hold fast to your confession of faith is by confidently entering the presence of God when life gets tough. That word confidently or boldly, it means loudly. It means clearly. It means distinctly. It means that I go into the presence of the Father the same way I go into my mama's house. When I go home to northwest Florida, I turn the key in the front door. Well, I, I try to. Sometimes I get confused with my key here. I haven't used it a lot these days. But, but I finally find that key, and I throw open the door, and I start talking before I ever see mama. That's the way that a Christian goes into the presence of the Father. Confidently, clearly, boldly, assuredly, we go into the presence of the Father because we've been there before. We go into the presence of the Father because we know we have a place there. We go into the presence of the Father because Jesus welcomes us there. The writer says, let us hold fast our confidence, our confession of faith. Let us confidently enter into the presence, into the throne of grace, so that we might find grace and help and mercy in time of need. These two directives go together. They can't be separated. You can't trust Jesus without turning to Him. You can't trust in Jesus without telling Him your problems. You can't expect to hold fast to your confession of faith unless you confidently go to the throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help in your time of need. And I think the problem for many of us is that we don't really trust Him with the difficult moments of our lives. We think that somehow a holy God is either too busy to care or too holy to deal. 
Too busy to care. There are other things that are more important. Lord, I, I, just, I can handle this one on my own. This is not that big of a deal. This is just a, a little matter. This is just a small concern. I don't really need to bring this to God. I can deal with this one on my own. He's got other things more important. I mean, after all, there's Iran and Israel and Iraq and Saudi Arabia for him to deal with. And then, you know, White House and Congress could use a little work. Amen. So sometimes we don't go to him because we think our problems are too insignificant and he's got more important things to do. Sometimes we don't go to him because our problems are so sinful and he's so holy we don't think he'd want to deal with us. And all the while, with those attitudes in our hearts, we drift further and further and further away from Jesus because we say that we trust in him, but we don't actually. In 1998, our family took a, a vacation to Glacier National Park we rode the train. I've probably told you all about that. I won't tell you all about it again. But we rode the train to Whitefish, Montana, caught it at New Orleans, and rode three days out there, spent eight days there, and we were to ride back. We got back to Chicago and were to catch the last leg of our train trip and come back into New Orleans the next day and found that because we had been delayed in our travels, the train that we were supposed to catch had already left the station. We were going to be at least a day delayed catching a train to New Orleans. They were trying to figure out what they would do with these 300 train travelers all going in different directions. In the middle of the night, in the Chicago train terminal, you can imagine how much fun that was. My daddy did not have the best patience in the world. He was rather short-tempered, especially in those days. And all of a sudden, he decided we were going home that night by car or plane. Somehow, some way, we were going home that night. And rather than patiently waiting for the train company to sort things out and tell us what they would do for us. And when it all played out, they actually would have put us up in a hotel that night and they actually would have bought us plane tickets and sent us home the next day. But instead, Daddy got a little hot under the collar and he demanded his refund for the last leg of the trip, which was all of $183.62. And then he set out to find a company that would rent us a car to come all the way to Pensacola. They don't rent cars to come all the way to Pensacola one way. They wouldn't rent him a car. So then he determined that we were going to find a flight. It's 9.30 at night, but surely there's a flight that's going to leave out of Chicago, headed to New Orleans or Pensacola or somewhere south. We'll catch one. There weren't any flights out that night. And of course, all the extra money they had, we had spent on the vacation, right? Y'all know what that's like. You, spend, you save up and then you spend it all and you're caught. And we were caught, four of us, sitting in a hotel room in Chicago wondering how in the world we're going to get home. And late at night, in a Chicago hotel room, without really any hope of getting himself home, or his two kids and his wife, I watched my daddy pick up the phone and call his dad and say, Daddy, I need your credit card number. I've got to buy four plane tickets. $1,600, by the way. Been better to be patient. We've laughed about that story in years since. There's a lot more color to it that I can tell when I'm not in the pulpit. But I've often looked back on that scene from August of 1998 and realized that when my dad got in a bind, he turned to his father. That's what he was there for. 
And too many times, you and I, dear brothers and sisters, get in a bind. And we don't turn to our Heavenly Father. Because we think that He's too busy. Or we think that He's too holy. When all the while, that's what He's there for. And the proof that you and I have a place in His presence is that our Savior, Jesus, the Son of God, has passed into His presence and opened the way for us to come to the throne of grace. So in Mississippi this week, they were worked up because they're going to put in God we trust on the flag. And all I really want to know is, do you trust in him? Or do you just say you do?